Over to you without further Thank you, Jack. Appreciate that very much. Um, I'm going to go briefly through an introduction of each of the panelists, just so the audience has a pretty clear picture of the broad area of, uh, areas of expertise that the panel uh, brings to the table. Uh, on, on my far right is uh, Rear Admiral Ron Rabago. He's the uh, Coast Guard's Assistant Commandant for Engineering and Logistics. Uh, he's responsible for all naval, civil, aeronautical, and industrial engineering, logistics, environmental, and energy management programs for the Coast Guard. Uh, he's also ASNE's Harold E. Saunders Award winner for this year. Um, to his left is uh, Rear Admiral Dave Johnson. Uh, he is the Program Executive Officer for Submarines, uh, but he's been a Program Manager for the Virginia class, uh, as well as, the, um, as a Program Manager's representative in uh, the shipyard uh, for the Virginia class. But he has uh, a much greater experience than that in, in, in the waterfront, but also in the, in the Trident Refit facility, uh, as well as uh, commanding the underwater uh, warfare centers. Uh, to his left is Rear Admiral Tom Moore, uh, Program Executive Officer for Aircraft Carriers. Uh, Tom's a nuclear trained officer uh, with uh, two nuclear cruiser tours, uh, a destroyer tour, a tour on Enterprise, uh, but he's done overhauls of Enterprise, Roosevelt, Nimitz, and the RCOH of Eisenhower, and worked on construction of Bush. Uh, so he is uh, deeply experienced in, in all things aircraft carrier. Uh, to his left is Rear Admiral Bryant Fuller, who is the Ship Design Integration and Naval Engineering, uh, is Deputy Commander for Ship Design Integration and Naval Engineering at the Naval Sea Systems Command, CO5, uh, NAVC's chief engineer. Uh, he's been a repair officer at Jacksonville, a project officer at Puget, an operations officer uh, at, at Portsmouth, the repair officer at a Triant Refit facility, operations officer at Puget, and the 83rd commander at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. Uh, so he really knows that waterfront. Um, I'm Joe Carnivale, and if you don't know who I am, you're probably in the wrong room. I think I used that line before. Um, to my left is, is Jim Stouch. Uh, he's the Vice President of Business Development and Sales at Precision uh, Custom Components. He's responsible for marketing and business development across uh, its three primary business segments of com commercial nuclear industry, chemical process industry, and military government segments. Uh, but he's had roles in manufacturing and steel and engineering consulting, uh, managed and implemented projects involving nuclear, mining, chemical processing, electronics, packaging, uh, steel production, and environmental control equipment. To his left is uh, Mr. David Rathburn, who is Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of U.S. Joiner, uh, the leading outfitter of habita habitability in America. Uh, they've recently acquired JCI Metal Products uh, and Infin Infinity Marine and the Assets of Maritime Services uh, co Corporation. Uh, he's also chairman, uh, he's also on the Board of Directors of Shipbuilders Council of America and chairman of our Partners Committee. Uh, and I, I had the pleasure of uh, witnessing a panel that he, he ran, uh, and he's, he's a virtual superstar of, of moderators. Uh, I thought I was like in the epi an episode of Inside the Actors Studio. It was just fabulous. I, <laughs> anyway, to his, to his left is, is, is Roy Arnold, who is CEO and president. Uh, he established IMACO uh, to apply modern, innovative, domestic, and international technologies uh, to systems in, in the shipbuilding to systems in shipbuilding uh, in the U.S. Uh, they do um, uh, systems integration of cargo handling systems, deck machinery, HVAC, fire alarms, fire suppression, uh, automation, including dynamic positioning systems, uh, a broad range of equipment. And finally, to his left is Kerry Corkin, who is president of the Entwistle Company that specializes in building shipboard machinery, including underway replenishment sea gear and aircraft launch and recovery equipment. They also design and ma manufacture specialized vehicles for the military, including the P-25 shipboard firefighting trucks, and, and also a variety of other uh, equipment for the Air Force and potable water systems for the Army. So you can see what a broad range of experience and expertise uh, that we have here at the table. <clears throat> and gentlemen, I, I would like this to be at least as interesting as, uh, as Olympic men's hockey that's being shown uh, on television upstairs, so body checks are authorized but no high sticking, please. Okay, industry won the toss, so gentlemen, will you ask your first question? The Navy appears to be 
depending heavily on please pull the microphone closer closer all right is that better yeah the uh, Navy appears to be depending heavily on competition to reduce the price of ships but competition has limited impact without the ability to incorporate change so my question to you is how is the Navy incentivizing its design community to accept or develop changes within the time constraints and the contract requirements? That might be the dumbest question I've ever heard. <laughs> and now provide an answer. And, and, and hopefully not the dumbest answer ever heard. Okay, uh, yeah, so really we, we've been working pretty hard uh, for the last several years and, and we've continued to uh, focus our efforts on accepting risk and we certainly have incentivized uh, our tech warrant holders and uh, the folks that support our warrant holders to uh, consider other solutions and uh, we're keeping a pretty regular drum beat working also with the PEOs on uh, what specifications can we relax, what's the I think the CNO likes to use the word, and which is a really good word as well, judicious. So what's the judicious amount of risk that we can uh, accept as we're uh, looking at what specifications are? So it's, uh, it's a big part of the culture uh, within NAFC 05 at least to go look at what the requirements are and, and question what it is and what's, what's the best solution from a cost schedule and, and technical rigor. Actually, it's not a dumb question. I just was trying to follow Joe's lead and make this a little bit more interesting than the hockey game. So, so. Um, You're not supposed to body check the ref. Was that high sticking? I just wanted to, just, it might have been close. Uh, okay, so uh, well, it's a good question. So uh, first of all, uh, competition I think is key to what, uh, on the government side of the house, uh, competition uh, in almost all cases that we do uh, helps uh, reduce costs. So we believe competition is a good thing. I think uh, if you go look at all the questions you all provided today and a lot of the questions that we provided back, there's a common theme there, which is what are we doing to each other that's driving cost up? And I think you're going to get a robust discussion on that today. So um, in terms of um, you know, what are we doing from a contracting side of the house, I guess I would turn the question back to you because it was an interesting question to me. What are we doing when, we, when you talk about competition, which we clearly want, uh, when you talk about design changes? Uh, what is is this something that's occurring in the contracting side of the house that we're doing to you? And could you could you exp could you kind of expand on it a little bit more? And then perhaps we can I can give you a little bit more detailed answer. I, I think uh, there are two parts. One is an existing contract where you come up with a suggestion that might reduce cost. The cycle time is so long that you're beyond it before you know, a decision really kind of comes back through. So. Um, that was my reason for asking about incentivizing people. I mean, what, what is their incentive to act quickly and to, to go through it? And then on new construction where you've got plenty of time, then, then it's a, a little bit different story, but it's, it's dealing more with, with your answer to begin with about looking at it ahead of time. But I'm thinking more in existing contracts. I'll just uh, I'll add a little bit from a submarine perspective here that we um, please pull your microphones really close because yes, people in the back can you. We we encourage the behavior of the design activity and the construction activity, which for me I'm, I'm lucky enough to have closely linked with Electric Boat, but also Newport News is closely linked with uh, the design yard folks, and that encourages through what we give as a modest investment to the design activity to continue to work on changes that'll benefit us both. Both in life cycle, we have this thing called reduced home ownership cost, where we invest some money for the design yard and some government activities to come up with ideas that will take the cost of sustaining the ships out, but also for driving the cost out in the new construction business too. I do think that you have to do some investments. You don't get anything for free, but the return on investment for industry is we don't change the target cost. So under current contracts, we both share on the underrun share line side. And then for us also, we benefit from the reduced cost going forward, especially if you're in a long time build like a Virginia class submarine or even a littoral combat ship where you got a volume of 30 to 50 ships to look forward to. So even an ROI of three to five gives you enough, in, enough incentive to go ahead and do some smart changes. Now as far as how long it takes, um, 
one example was we tried to simplify how we put coating on the Jimmy Carter and Tom Eccles is in the audience here as we went through that and uh, we it, it, it took personal attention from the program manager with the technical folks to keep the pressure on to get the decisions made so it actually got into construction and impacted the cost of that ship so some of these we have enough bandwidth to do applied targeted efforts on if in fact they're the right ROI and we should be focusing what we need from industry is we need the case we need the homework done and if it's laid out well enough then we in fact can go do something and on the very big ones we can go push on them. Uh, Admiral Eccles had about eight things that he wanted to attack. One of the simplest things was paint. Big deal. You know we got high solids paint in the Virginia class under a new construction cost reduction but I tell you what that has saved us in the in-service side because of longevity of that paint system. So just an example I think there are avenues there we do and we do not discourage industry although it may look like that to you sometimes um, to actually bring forth good changes. I might just uh, just add from our, our acquisition programs and our sustainment programs, one of the things that we've been really working really hard on, and, and it's certainly been manifested in, in, our, in our, search, our most recent uh, announcements in terms of the offshore patrol cutter, is we spent a good deal of time on requirements. And requirements not just in a broad sense, but also at the systems level uh, in creating a, a good indicative design that was based on uh, uh, sort of a, as, a, as a parsed set of requirements so that we could evaluate um, potentially, you know, changes, but certainly even initial offerings of technology and capabilities to solve a particular problem. So I don't I think if you don't know what your requirements are, just about anything will fit in the slot, and, uh, and that brings along change. But if you know what your requirements are, you have the ability to judge new ideas, potential changes, and make sure that they fit within the requirements. The other thing that we've done is, is uh, We've emphasized instead of um, highly complex integrated systems, we're leaning more towards federated systems that uh, allow a little bit more modularity when it comes to things that are really dynamic, especially in the world of C4ISR. Um, and so that gives us some flexibility because even today we know that things that uh, will have electrons running through them five years from now will be different from what we can envision and what we can even buy off the shelf. And so you have to set up a, an acquisition strategy that en enables those kinds of inevitable fact of life things that are going to occur uh, as, as, as much as you can. So those are a couple of things. I, I roger up that competition is, still has to be a big part of it. Uh, that, that drives a certain element, but I agree also that uh, you've got to set yourself up uh, initially with, a, with the ability to respond to changes as they come because they will come, uh, uh, but uh, controlling them with uh, uh, those those methods I chose I just mentioned uh, could be ways to keep your cost down. So we're appreciative of the perspective from the senior leadership side about the desire to take change and try to implement it into the system. The the frustration on our side is that that doesn't necessarily seem to translate throughout the organization. And so, what would you suggest to us from a perspective of when we miss multiple ships? Uh, in the opportunity to change specifications that we've made proposals, made suggestions, they're in line with current practices both by foreign navies as well as in the commercial world, but we can't seem to get attention to that. So we have no disagreement, I think, at the senior leadership side, but how do we get down into the organization and help drive that change in order to do what we all need to do in this budget environment, which is reduce the cost of ships? Yeah, so one of the things, uh that uh, I started working with O5 years ago when Tom Eccles was the chief engineer is, and I've told Newport News is, hey, if you have an idea to something that's gonna reduce cost uh, and you submit it, the only person that can say no, we're not gonna go do that is up at the flag level. And so I'm trying to encourage uh, down the deck plate engineer or the deck plate program folks to say yes. It's in kind of like uh, if you're uh, like a leave chit where everybody, anybody in the chain of command can approve somebody going on leave. The only person that can say, no, you can't go on leave is the commanding officer. Um, so that process has worked for us. And what, it, what it's trying to do is give uh, high cover to the young engineers to say, hey, look, we want to lean forward and take a little bit of risk here uh, on some of these affordability initiatives. It's really easy to say, no, just stick with the status quo because you, you are accepting a little bit of risk. And well, I've got your back if you decide to take that risk and you say yes, you know, I'll take you know, I'll raise my hand and said, this is, you know, this is the direction we want to take. And it's worked out pretty well. And you'd be surprised uh, 
over time how few things actually then get pushed up to, say, to me where we ultimately have to say no because we're trying to encourage our folks to say yes and I would you know, encourage the same thing back on the industry side. Let's, let's move on to the next question. And that would be the government side. Okay, so uh, one of the first ones I got, one thing we've noticed uh, as we're doing some of our, our, our cost estimating and, and, and uh, supporting the PEOs and such is we're seeing a lot of support costs going up uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the builder side. So, we're, uh, so I'm curious is are there things in the ship specifications that are driving additional overhead costs in the private sector? If so, you know, what are they and what can we do about that? Well, I think there are a couple of things, um, and we'll get to, to some of these later going back the other way, but um, several things that we've observed is uh, we have to abide uh, by several different security regimes. We've got no foreign BPMI's interpretation, no foreign others. Um, we've got uh, confidential ITAR and the like. And uh, most of us are small businesses, and so you kind of default to the most stringent because you don't want to run three programs, four programs concurrently. And uh, so you're defaulting to the most stringent, therefore it drives costs on those programs that uh, are not as stringent. Uh, so that's a duplicity of requirements that is driving cost on those programs that don't necessarily have to have that level of attention. Um, there are, uh, there have been a number of examples given throughout the, the couple of days here. Um, SOC valve, I think, has shared stories on a repeated basis about the same valve, but to different rev levels of drawings, those kinds of drivers. And, um, you know, that's a pretty basic commonality issue. It's not a different fan. You can use a different fan for the same purpose. It's basically the same valve, it's just rev levels on drawing differences. And those are some examples that, uh, that have, uh, I think, introduced cost to the system that we've, that we've observed. Just following up on that, we make um, the exact same equipment for CG47, DDG51, LPD, LHA, LHD. And in some cases, we carry four or five different part numbers because the paint spec is different. Some have flame spray, some don't have flame spray. Um, the rev levels may be different on the material requirement. <clears throat> so the, the specifications can add a lot of extra costs just because you're handling the same part in many different ways. And I think uh, the rest of the group has noticed it. It's come up in other discussions over the last couple of days also. The next industry question. That's me. The solicitation process um, and bidding to the major shipyards has become even more cumbersome. We were often asked to provide a ROM followed by a firm fixed price and offer, often several revisions which can be over the course of a year or even longer. We're generally given very short response times, usually blamed on the Navy. Of course. With complex <laughs> machinery systems involving hundreds of parts and subcontractors, Unreasonably short response times tend to lead to higher prices on firm fixed priced orders. Um, you just allow for unknown contingencies. Reasonable response times lead to more competitive, lower cost bids. What can be done to reduce the churn in the process and allow sufficient time to prepare a bid? I think there's a very simple answer. First is a customer needs to know what the heck the requirement is. And if we don't change the requirement, we don't end up in this do loop where you have to actually continually change the solicitation while you're doing it. And then therefore you cut out the churn and the reasons for our quick response times. So doing some thought ahead of time before we engage or at least engage you in a formal solicitation would uh, seem to be a first order effector of driving out this churn. Yeah, I think the other thing is uh, you know, this uh, endless do loop of uh, we give you a spec, we throw it over the throw it over the fence, we wait for you to respond, we, you throw it back to us, we say, no, that's not what I wanted, throw it back over the fence, causes a lot of this. And um, so, 
you know, what, what I've found, at least in the carrier business, we're getting Uber News, the thing that works best for us is, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, alpha contracting, whatever, is to get into a room and just have a discussion and then get to a, get to a, a common understanding of exactly what you're looking for uh, before you go off and spend a lot of time putting a bid together and build, doing the process. I think when we do that, we, you know, we're able to streamline the process and cut costs out of the, of the, uh, of the, the bid process. And we get better, uh, we get better uh, results as you know as a result of that, and then we're able to get to, to get, you know to shorten the timelines down to contracting, pretty good. So I, I would encourage you if you're not in not doing that, um, you know, trying to work w with the prime. You know, we have actually uh, gone and visited sub vendors with with the prime together uh, to have that discussion. And kind of the interesting thing was it was kind of uh, something we had never done on the Navy side of the house. And uh, I had a couple of engineers from Detroit that worked, uh, that got laid off in Detroit. We hired some, some of the auto engineers to work for us, fantastic s uh, folks with a lot of great ideas. And I had a guy that said, um, you know, he worked for Ford and he was buying uh, diesel engines from a company. And he said he would never have dreamed of, uh, of a bid uh, without going to that, with that guy who built the diesel engine down to his sub vendor to talk about the specific components. And so we took that as an idea going forward. And, I think it's paid dividends for us on the carrier side of the house. I'm sure you can't do it on every program, but that, that would be an ideal situation because if you can get together with the, the end user yourself and the shipyard and say, what are you really looking for so you can nail the spec down in a very short period of time without all kinds of back and forth between you, that, that sounds like a great solution. Thank you. Next couple question. Okay, uh, and don't tell me this is a terrible question. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it is. <laughs> okay, back on the theme, uh, uh, I think you're going to see a lot of this come from. Uh, what is uh, industry doing to drive affordability and reduce lead times into your programs? Where we have the uh, quantity that, uh, that we can make. Um, we certainly have done lean reviews where that quantity justifies. Uh, my company makes a lot of ones and twos of things, but where we do have a quantity, you know, more than four or five or six or ten or something, uh, we've done lean reviews to great advantage. And I think our, our uh, first-year customer and ultimately the Navy has resp uh, responded and benefited greatly and, in fact, um, have provided assistance to us as a, as a second tier to the Navy in uh, helping facilitate those. So that's a, that's a good thing, I think, for all of us. Uh, investment in machine tools, certainly. Um, the block buys as a sitting behind that, giving us the confidence to make an investment, which we have done, uh, that there will be a certain quantity here. We still have to compete for it, still have to do what we have to do, but uh, nonetheless, to make that investment, if we were just bidding one or two, uh, we'd never think of it. Um, some of these machines are, they're intermediate, they're bigger than our small stuff, smaller than our big stuff, and so we wouldn't naturally make that investment if we saw that there were only going to be one or two of the specific component that I have in mind when I say that. But that's, that's an answer. Um, and then business information tools, uh, you know, we can't believe I'm saying this, but uh, ERP systems uh, do have a place. And, uh, you know, it's been many years since we implemented uh, the one we have now, and we're still learning every day things about our business that we can um, determine. And again, the, the trite phrase, what uh, you can't, can't measure, you can't manage. And certainly the ability to get in and measure things where we determine there's a cost driver, now we can actually go back and without putting people on the floor doing time and motion studies can, can go comb some data and get our arms around an area to go attack. So there are some things that I think that are actively in the system. Obviously there's a, a collective driver in terms of, of budget availability and, um, and the need and the demand competition uh, that's uh, forcing us to, to take hard looks at some of those things that naturally if you don't have to do them, you wouldn't do them. But we do and we are. In a, in a, in a 
bigger group since um, over the past year or two, um, industry associations like MMA have really taken on this challenge of trying to get the group together and sort this out. Um, the Global Shipbuilding Executive Summit yesterday, that's dealing with the same kind of thing, trying to understand what's really causing it, what are the priorities where you can get the most bang out of it for, for looking. So Shipbuilders Council, another one. Um, so on, on, in that sense, there's a lot of active dialogue going on out there. I think one of the things that that's telling us is um, kind of back to your requirement statement, the earlier we can get involved together and, and nail that down, the better off we are and understand the trade-offs and understand the advantages. So um, getting involved earlier is, I think, a key. I think I just add to what Jim said in that um, whether it's investing in an ERP system or a uh, vertical machining center or whatever you're talking about, the instability over the last couple of years has not done a lot to encourage industry to spend any money on anything. And I think if we go through a few more years and we see that things have smoothed out a little bit and maybe even a budget would get you know passed and implemented and that goes on for a while, I think you'll see industry um, step up to the plate a little bit more. Follow-ups? Next industry question, please. How does the Navy believe or, or how would the Navy respond to the question that the way you contract today is different as a result of the should cost perspective when it comes to contracting? That's a great question. I, I actually want to. I want to start off in the lead because um, should cost. In my PEO, we're trying to institute it across all my little programs to my big ACAT one programs. It's right in alignment with Secretary Kendall's Better Buying Power initiatives. Um, in a couple ways, I think that we can get at the heart of your question. If you're going to have a should cost perspective in developmental contracts, you ought to incentivize the design agent or the builder to go after those should cost initiatives. So if something even as big as Ohio replacement, we put in specific cost incentives for the design yard to achieve if they pulled on not only design, but also construction and ONS costs. Things that we could say, yep, you achieved them, here's your incentive fee to drive down um, over a billion dollars out of our design that goes over about 20 years. So that I think you can do it in developmental contracts and construction contracts if you're smart about how you lay out your incentives. And I think you need, we, the government, need to give you a good balance of incentives and investments, things that we call CapEx, but help you refacilitize and meet hurdle, hurdle rates, help you get incentivized on costs, may even beyond what we put on a target on a share line. And then um, the third one is to maybe give you some incentives on schedule, which in my business, schedule to me, time is money. So if I can incentivize you to continue to reduce the schedule down, deliver the product faster, therefore I save costs get it to the operator faster, and we, y you make more money. So it's all good incentives, I think, that tie into that. And we had that in all our Virginia contracts to date, and we're just about to negotiate that into the block four um, Virginias. I think the second part is, having just gone through a almost year plus long evolution with uh, electric boat, is our ability in the government to understand the second and third tier supplier base costs, sometimes better than the prime understands those costs. We're, we are at a truly an inflection point here where we're not just taking, hey, this is what I did on the first 10 Virginias, and therefore I'll just take 5% off of that. Not a price-based decrement approach, but a cost build-up approach where you get maybe three to four times a decrement from traditional approaches and I think it's because we now go in and have the acumen to go with the cost look at how they're doing and not only how you're what you did but in fact compared to in commercial or other similar industry practices do you measure up out of your 40-hour work week are you actually getting the productivity that we'd expect in that kind of a similar industry so I think that our ability to understand cost structures benchmark and actually go after and spend the time and work with the primes to get at 
the vendor base understanding helps us, I think, all reach what I call should cost <coughs> perspective. Yeah, I would agree with that 100%. I, when, uh, you know, when we talked to Secretary Kendall, he makes it clear as, um, you know, should cost is to provide a f well, laser like focused on affordability. That's the goal. Um, and so, you, you know, you start with a will cost number or a budget number, and you, when you contract, uh, you know, it's probably your 50, 50 point on the risk curve, it's your target cost on your contract. And what you're trying to do is provide, you know, real meaningful, tangible things that you could do to drive that cost down. And so I think in order to, to make it realistic, what we've got to do is work with the prime and with the sub vendors to incentivize you to, okay, this is what I'm paying you, but, you know, I'd like to get down here, share that with you, and work collectively on what we can, can do to get that down. Some of these discussions we're having today and some of the discussions that we've had w with, with Huntington Ingalls and Purdue's when we go to the sub vendors are very helpful for us. I think Dave's hit the nail on the head, which is you know, a lot of these savings, I think, are going to be the second and third tier guys. We, you know, we went and uh, looked, you know, you've heard about CO6 and the Common Allen Initiative. When we went to talk to, uh, you know, a, a particular vendor on the carrier, um, you know, we said, hey, w what's driving you nuts? Why, what's driving your cost up? And, you know, rather than whining about it, the guy listed three or four very concrete things that we had no idea we were doing to him. And, um, when we recognize that, we were able to put in place some th some things that would incentivize not only the prime but also s incentivize the sub vendor to get that cost down. So, I wouldn't look at should cost as uh, something that's uh, trying to squeeze every penny. I, I my view is that should cost is collectively to provide us a a a, a, a group focus on what's the art of the possible and what could we do collectively to get cost out of these programs. Because going forward, as you heard, if you heard me talk yesterday, at least in the carrier business. It's the biggest, the biggest enemy to the carrier right now is not all the anti-access weapons out there or China or anybody else building the aircraft carrier. It's the cost of the platform. So we want to have a viable carrier industrial base. We've got to figure out how to get cost out. And the only way to do that is to work with you on that. So. Uh, quick follow-up question. I, I thought I heard this morning, my understanding of what I heard, was that uh, some of the, uh, the cost share program dollar availability came from some canceled ships from years ago. Is there a uh, rationing or a shrinking of the pie available for share line, cost share? If, if that was a discussion that happened earlier in this conference, yeah, yeah, I, I, I wasn't part of it. So um, I, we just, through our incentive fee structure, we, we, we lay out, if you look at our current block three contract on Virginia's, we have a base fee and then we have a, a set of incentives that go on top of it that's in, in the order of a fourth to the fifth of what a fifth of the amount that's available in the base fee but important and just like what's done on the carrier contracts is that we incentivize a net present value hurdle rate approach so that investments can be made and you can win the day in our rather low margin but high cash business long term against either IT or other segments in the portfolio of an HII or a Northrop Grumman or a a general dynamics so that in fact we we get the investment that benefits both of us um, and it helps us in the long term I, I love those kind of incentives because they have added value far beyond the instant contract we're working next government question please with reductions uh, to travel budgets it's increasingly difficult to conduct all of our desired inspections of critical parts at manufacturers facilities what are industry's recommendations to improve this process while still meeting the government's requirements and achieving the desired level of quality and confidence in the finished product this is one of the subjects that's come up several times in different conferences over the last couple of days but um, from our perspective Things are being inspected too many times by too many different groups of people. We do um, Allray, for example, and um, DCMA will witness it. We'll send the part down to Lakehurst. They inspect it. They send it back to us. Lakehurst sends a person to our plant to watch us. <coughs> excuse me. Put it together. DCMA witnesses that. It's it's just constant um, trying to coordinate schedules and. We have two resident DCMA guys in house, so it, it's relatively easy, but it's still very time consuming, very expensive. I, I think the government needs to 
take a big step back and decide who they want performing the inspections. Either you know turn it over to DCMA and let them do it, and they have you know specialists who um, handle different commodities. Obviously, you can't have somebody doing raincoats and catapult and rusting gear, or or get them out of it and let the customer come in. But I I would say with the majority of stuff that we manufacture. There's at least, not including our inspections, there's at least two other people who witness the inspections. The customer, whether that's the shipyard, electric boat, Newport News, plus DCMA. And um, it, it's very expensive, it takes a lot of time. And um, one of the things you may not see is it, it really affects the schedule a lot because there's a lot less people around. You guys are very restricted on how you let them travel and um, we sometimes wait for weeks for someone to come up and inspect it. So what do you do when that happens? Who do you tell? Uh, well, well, normally by that time, the customer's calling, complaining that the part's <laughs> late. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it gets resolved, but it, it's a very regular occurrence. For example, we're in the uh, Worcester region of uh, Massachusetts, and. Um, Probably 10 years ago, we had 25 um, government inspectors, but and I'm not talking about staff people, people who were out in the plants actually looking at parts, you know, doing mechanical inspections, double checking, uh, NDT, and things like that. They're down to eight. Two of them are in our plant and they're residents, but they also cover 25 or 30 other plants. And I mean, they're really good guys. They work hard, they're very knowledgeable. You, you, we've got to work with them. You know, and if they can't be there on Tuesday to do MPI, then they come in the next Tuesday or Thursday whenever we can schedule them. It's, it's an issue. Well, as a, as a follow-up um, with all that inspections, mm. um, is there a way to, uh, besides, you know, coordinating from the government side, which clearly is, a, is an obligation, makes sense to do that, a uh, single entity, is there anything with regards to, and of course I have to be kind of generic because it's many different manufacturing things, but is there a way that you would um, um, drive quality in so that there's a single at the end or there is some sort of a, uh, other kinds of uh, you know, ISO processes, those kinds of things that you manage internally anyway, any good company has those things that then uh, represent uh, uh, an ability to do less inspections but at the critical point? Uh, is there some risk that you take as a manufacturer on that? Because uh, obviously if you're not being micromanaged, God knows what you might do, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that's a good follow-up. And actually, when I'm done, done, I'd ask Jim to maybe um, give me his opinion also, because we, we do s not the same products, but similar sorts of things. W we are ISO 9001. And uh, we have all of those processes in place. And our stuff tends to come with very, very good pedigrees, just based on the sort of parts that we're making. Um, in our opinion, you could probably eliminate all inspection because I think we're harder on ourselves than you know than you are. Um, but that's a very hard sell, and it's tough to get you know Lakehurst to give up on all race stuff, and it's tough to get Newport News and Electric Boat to give up on their stuff. And I understand that. I, I don't know whether you would rather let the shipyards and um, and the Navy do it and get DCMA out of it because they have lots of other things they could be doing, or Get, get the customer out of it and turn it over to DCMA. I don't, I don't know that I'm really the one to give an opinion on which way it should go, but it's, it seems wasteful to do both. Yeah, it, the, uh, the uh, field is, uh, is somewhat pre-plowed here. Um, the commercial industry faces the same challenge, particularly in the commercial nuclear industry. Uh, lots of paper, lots of people want to see it. Our customer, uh, Westinghouse or Mariba GE, as well as their customer a utility. Um, in some cases, they both want to sign off. However, uh, when we get to a uh, witness point or a, even a, a data book sign off point, once a particular feature is signed off, it doesn't get revisited. That initial goes on that page, comes back, it doesn't come back again. It's not always been that way. And we try very early in the process to agree with the customer uh, this is the way we're going to handle this, right? And, uh, and it saves everybody a lot, of, a lot of time and money. Repeated visits to our place from them, uh, having to redo paperwork, uh, you know, on our side, having to even, you know, inspect things. Laser trackers are great devices, but, you know, 
Actually, maybe I can direct this to Admiral Moore. Um, this could really be all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> it usually is. Just ask. Thank uh, you. Just ask David Todd. It always is. That, that goes back to the dumb question comment at the beginning. <laughs> it just occurred to me that on a lot of your equipment, you actually start the process because someone, whether it's at Soup Ship Newport News or wherever, is writing a letter of delegation. He's the one who actually starts that process. He's telling DCMA exactly what to do every single step, and he does that for every, if, if we're building nose gear launch or uh, retraction engine, whatever the piece of equipment is, he goes to every single drawing and tells them every dimension to check on it. So you, you, you may have more control over the process than you think. If he puts nothing down, the process automatically gets handled by DCMA. I, I'm not suggesting that, but at the very beginning, you do have the opportunity to dial in how much you want to be seen. Okay, thanks. Well, let's have the next industry question, please. Okay, fairly straightforward. We've had a lot of, uh, I think, discussion about this, uh, a lot of open, um, very uh, much open to, uh, to participation, certainly by the first tiers with the second and third tiers. Uh, uh, but I'm interested in your perspective, uh, how the, the second and third tier <coughs> suppliers can communicate cost drivers to the end user. Sometimes our communication with uh, the yards are, you know, I mean, it's a Navy design. Therefore, um, we're stuck in a way. And uh, next generation or generation after that, I think some of the discussion so far is the length of time it takes. But what, what's, uh, in your view, the best way to, to get that communication uh, going and continuing from the second and third tiers? Okay, so I'll start this one off. So uh, one of the discussions that uh, we're having right now with uh, HII is uh, kind of getting exactly to what we've talked And we've actually hit around it quite a bit uh, on this discussion this afternoon. Um, and I guess after being, on, again, running a shipyard for a while and, and trying to manage the supply chain from a production standpoint, I, uh, I, I guess I kind of knew this but didn't quite realize the scope of it until we really sat down and looked at some of the data and, and such that HII had, had uncovered was exactly right. We've got a lot of specifications, revs, or different requirements for the same component, different stock numbers. That used to drive me crazy, right? You got the same component, it's got multiple stock numbers and such. So clearly, um, there's great opportunity there. So we're going to kick off a pilot in, in, you know, in, um, in partnership with industry, if you would, to go understand better what the uh, second and third tiers, you know, some of the problems they are saying. Because again, you know, a problem well-defined is a problem half solved, right? So I think uh, the more visibility we can get, so this pilot is certainly like one initiative uh, or one, one method of doing that. And I think as we build on that, we'll be able to come up with maybe some other forms. But we definitely need to know what what is causing you to have problems. And again, if it's um, everything from stock number specifications to rev numbers and such as that, then uh, then we need, to, we need to know what that is. So I think that's the, there's a breakdown, I think, in the communication. Also, talking to industry, um, I think they also sometimes add requirements, or as they call it, I like the word desirements, uh, to, uh, to the components as well which may be totally unknown to us. And then sometimes our waterfront organizations, like the supervisors, is, uh, sometimes they add their own requirements. Uh, I know I've stumbled upon a few things right now that, again, it comes back to me, the source of all evil, of, of what's, uh, why is the specifications like that? And you know, I pull my warrant holder up and they go, hey boss, that's, that's not our requirement. And you start pulling the string and you find out somewhere between the time the specification got signed out by the chief engineer until it showed up at the third tier, somebody in that line laid a requirement on there. So again, if don't have visibility on that, if nobody in the chain has visibility on that, then it's obviously not gonna get fixed. So I think that's what we've gotta go figure out how to go do, is how do we bring these things up to visibility and then question ourselves, is that really what we wanna go do? What's the value added uh, of doing that? If there's no value added, then why do we wanna do it? But uh, it's, it's a, it's a problem that's got to be solved. 
I'd like to add to what uh, Bryant said in that, um, you know, from a shipbuilding PEO perspective, we invest long-term significant U.S. resources in our shipbuilding industrial base. And through the primes, I think they have a responsibility to actually go after and understand down in their supplier base, maybe one or two levels at least below where they're at, to try to encourage this kind of discussion. Like I talked, we had good insight when we were negotiating a contract for a Virginia-class submarine, but I think the primes can enable this because, frankly, we don't have the bandwidth to cover for Virginia. It's 5,000 vendors across the entire U.S. But the primes can add to this, and I think with a long-term commitment, significant investment, there's really a responsibility to drive every dollar of unnecessary costs out of this infrastructure and industry that we do in the shipbuilding world and that they can facilitate and help this. That forum that Brian talked about with HII was great. It was almost a videotape of exactly some of the things that you were saying. Same valve, different weld requirements, therefore what goes on a CVN I can't put on an SSN. It's a different part number. Makes no sense. Now obviously you don't want to accrete every part to the highest accumulation of every requirement and make it expensive. But there are vendors. I was over at Sheffield Forge Masters over in the United Kingdom. They do castings high quality. They do them all like they're a nuclear casting because it's just easier and frankly it drives out his cost because the stuff he produces doesn't have defects which cost a lot on the back end. So there is a way to get at this but I think A, we need to do a better job of encouraging that type discussion. We've started that forum under Bryant's leadership with the PEOs helping them but I do think the primes the GDs, the HIIs, they have a responsibility, too, to do this with their supplier base so that we can drive out these costs. There's, I'll make a follow-up comment. You know, one of the things that sometimes happens, and you, you talked a little bit about it, is a, 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 a second or third uh, tier supplier provides a component. There are components that are designed to be low cost, meet the basic requirements, and, and go in there. And there are other components that you can buy that are higher end, you talked about, you know, making it up to a, a higher level standard. Of course, you usually pay for that addition. And if we're not, from the government's perspective, clear on whether a, uh, maybe a lower grade commercial, maybe not the same duty cycle is okay versus something that must not fail for the first 10 years, then we create that uncertainty in there and then we can have second and third tier suppliers providing products that don't meet those requirements. So I think there's some, some value in dialogue and educating from the basic requirements, but also in what is our expectation for that uh, those that system as a whole, but made up by components that create a, uh, a kind of a long-term usability. And it goes to a, another question we'll talk about in just a minute, which is, you know, how do you keep the cost out so that you uh, don't pay attention to not just the acquisition costs, but also uh, to the life cycle at the system level instead of at the um, at the asset level or the platform level. Next government question, please. All right. I think I'll ask one. So um, if, you, if you read such a fine publication like Inside Defense, and I think we have Lee Hudson here somewhere in the back, she wrote an article from an interview I did just a few days ago talking about how we can be smart about how we buy our material for our ships. And so this question hits at, how can industry reduce cost to the government by combining material buys across separate construction contracts? Um, it's something I'm personally very interested in, and I think it's something that we could do a much better job. And you even could add not only construction, but also in service, that DLA or others are out buying material. It's the exact same stuff we put in new construction. So, so at the risk of beating a dead horse here, because you've heard some of these things already, Admiral. Um, the challenge is across programs is to see if we can find a way to define the requirement the same. So on this same stage, Erwin Eden Zone talked about the fact that there were five different welding standards that they were working to for the ships that they have in their current portfolio. Uh, we know that there are multiple different paint standards and coating standards, again, uh, for Navy ships and environment in the world that I live in. Uh, the rack that I build for an aircraft carrier is different than the one that I build for an LHA, which is different than the one that I build for an LPD, which is different than the one that I build for a DDG, which is different than the one I build for a Coast Guard carrier, which is also different from the MSC ships that we build. Now, some would argue that a rack is a rack is a rack, right? And, and, I, and I get the fact that we might have differentiation from a perspective of 
We need different size lockers as an example. Well, I've got highly computerized programming that can make that locker grow in size or width or depth. But when the construction requirement is different from ship class to ship class to ship class, then I have to go in and design it again. So you want to combine requirements by buying across ship classes, then what we need is a defined standard that says we're going to achieve these things in this way. The challenge that we've found is we try to go back and say to the customer, hey, we'd like to do this like we do it over here. Oh, no, 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 that's, that's not the way we like it on DDGs. This is the way we like it on DDGs. Or no, 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 it's a different requirement on an, on an LPD versus an LHA. And so there are lots of opportunities. And so, and I don't know whether or not NAV C06 is something that we can rely on to help bring us together in that regard. And so I'd be interested in your perspective relative to that. But that's the challenge. I think there's tremendous, and, and not just I, and, and, and as Joe mentioned, I'm fortunate to be the chair of the Allied Partners Committee for the Shipbuilders Council of America, which represents 94 separate and distinct supplier companies uh, that service uh, the Navy and the Coast Guard and the government in their shipbuilding programs. There's a strong belief that if we can find a way to make that paradigm shift and, and get together the folks that make the decisions on what the paint system is, or what the weld system is, or what the, the, the furniture is, or, or anywhere else, and we could get all of those warrant holders and all of those folks in the PEO community together in a room and have that conversation like you talked about relative to the supplier and say, let's come up with a standard. If we could find a way to do that, and maybe that's not possible, if we could find a way to do that, there is absolutely money to be saved, but it's a big challenge. I think, uh, you know, what we're trying to do with NAVC 6 is also another, f f you know, some of this is, uh, uh, by the time I find out about the problem, uh, it's too late. And uh, usually when I find out about it, I pull my hair out. I look at my guys and, you know, why were we that dumb? Why did we do that? And a lot of times it's because, as you said, we're, we operate our own stovepipes. I'm a destroyer. I do this. I'm a carrier. I do this. We need to get out of that. I think NAVC 6 is designed to kind of provide that, uh, ability to cross program and I guarantee you at the PEO level that uh, you know Dave Johnson and, and Dave Lewis and myself and Brian Tony are completely committed to finding common solutions you know I always tell people if you have you want a common affordable radar if you want affordable radar the you know common has to come along with it it's pretty hard to do that so um, you know I, I, I'm not suggesting and I, but I don't have any problem if you guys call me directly um, not attribution. You can pick up the phone, call me anytime, and say, "Hey, this is driving me nuts." I would prefer to work, you know, through the through the prime. Uh, but you know, forums like this, and I think CO6 is going to provide you an opportunity uh, to come voice some of these concerns. And then, you know, Dave and I will be sitting there listening, and then Nav CO6 is going to kind of be the band leader on this. I I think there's great opportunity. Uh, I'm excited about this commonality thing because I think it really gets to the heart of what we're trying to do from an affordability side of the I think that uh, we are going to make some strides, but it's, it's absolutely a cultural thing. And we're going to have, we've got some cultural issues, uh, not only with the prime, but with ourselves as well. And we're just going to have to work our way through that. Yeah, so part of that is, again, you know, we need to go figure out, so this is, a, I'll, I'll take a look up on this one. I've, I've got 196 technical warrant holders that work for me. I'm, I'm pretty sure I don't have a rack tech warrant holder, but I might. Um, <laughs> That's okay. We're building to the 1964 standard, okay. so it's reasonably right. current. Okay. But, uh, yeah, so again, it's, it's where, did the, where, did the, where did the spec come from? Where did the, and again, we, a lot of times we use the uh, generic word specification, right, uh, which may mean a lot of things to different people. But I, I'll, I'll take a look up on this, and I'll work with the PEOs. If I, and, uh, again, figure out, so who's making the different rack? So I get it on a submarine. We've got a different rack than we do a DDG. Um, but it, it, great point, right? DDG, LPD, LHD, CBN, racks ought to kind of be standard, right? Your hot rack, they've got to be a different size. So, <laughs> so anyway, but I'll go pull the string. But again, part of it again is we need to understand where is this um, change being injected into the into the process. So, I, I got to look up on that one. I think this falls within this question, but. Um, on, on DDG 1000, um, we, we had about 100,000 pounds of steel um, per ship. 
And um, we, I learned yesterday that most of the weight of the ship, but a small part of the cost is the steel. However, on DDG 1000, it was dictated that all of the hull material be metric sized. It was an absolute nightmare for all of us. I'll, I'll give credit to Bath Ironworks. They finally um, jumped in when all the suppliers came back and said, we can't buy 25 you know, millimeter steel. We can get close to it. And they said, oh no, it has to be metric steel because it's matching all of their their decks, you know, if we make a part of the ship, it's got to line up and the beams were actually welded out of metric plate because there's no such thing in this company, in this country as metric beams. I mean, there's a, an example of something the Navy did that I think probably added tremendous cost to the ship. And it, it's the only one I've ever heard of that had a metric plate requirement. I, I don't know if anybody else knows of that, but um, all of the so who's all the chief engineer in uh, was, was 1998? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where's PO ships? <laughs> all right, let's. let's let, let, let me, let me okay. just add uh, a real simple one that is not across platforms, but it's in the same contract. I don't have a single contract where the spare parts are bought at the same time I'm manufacturing the equipment. So it costs you probably 50 percent more. So we're, that, that is a great point, and we're working with uh, Admiral Pimpo right now, and my in, uh, team submarine is uh, acquisition side, that's me, but uh, in-service side, that's Mike Jabale, and we are trying to get at that. So while we're doing equipment buys for extended docking SRAs for Virginia-class submarines, I want to buy that stuff at the exact same time I'm buying 10 ship sets worth of material for 10 new ships. We can be better than that, and, and I frankly, I mean, we may or because it may or may not happen we may not get as much of a benefit of going from say 10 ship sets to 12 because you might buy two to support the maintenance piece but the in-service side will see a great cost benefit so i might not see it so much in the ship acquisition side because i already get a pretty good volume benefit but if i'm buying 12 instead of two huge difference so i, I think we have a lot of potential if we do just like you said we focus on buying that stuff at the same time it's a little bit of risk but if you manage it right and we have the guy in DLA who wants to do this with us um, we ought to strike while the iron is hot so that, that, you're, you're exactly right next industry question please The relatively small number of ships that I have gone through design phases in the last 20 years have kind of left uh, the Navy and, and the shipyards with a dwindling number of experienced engineers and ship designers. Um, much of the supplier community has fared a little better since they can draw upon the experience of working with multiple yards, multiple contracts and uh, perhaps also are more engaged in other industries, uh, commercially, offshore, the oil and gas and things. And um, so with fewer and fewer planned and longer spans between them, um, you know, does the Navy consider or are you looking at ways to engage the supplier base uh, design experience uh, more directly as opposed to a design house or, or the, the shipyards. So uh, that's uh, perfect, and actually you uh, saved me from asking my uh, next question because, I mean, first off, uh, without a doubt, the, the most valuable asset that, that we have are, are, are our people. And um, the, the expertise and the, the, the uh, knowledge that uh, the workforce, the engineering, the, the government, government engineering workforce is just, just phenomenal. Um, and that being said, though, I, I cannot execute my statutory authority of technical, uh, technical authority without having, you know, the right number of subject matter experts. But given today's complex world we live in and uh, rapidly changing, there is no way we can have the, the best knowledge of, of, of everything. So we have got to figure out a better way of uh, making sure that we're leveraging the exact knowledge uh, that you're talking about right here. And so that's kind of one of my priorities is, um, is I'm, you know, taking over from Tom Eccles in moving is how do we 
manage the naval engineering, and this is, I think, where ASNI could come in, and some Amy and some of the other societies help as well. How do we manage this precious knowledge base um, across the whole naval engineering spectrum, if you would, to make sure that we are covering the right bases? And in some areas, it's probably the right place for it to be out in the private sector. Some, some disciplines or some aspects of some disciplines um, some areas we've got to keep it in the government because again we've got to uh, you know when mom, we have to make the decision on is this acceptable or not and I have to sign my name I've got to have you know the go-to person you know on my staff that uh, can understand it well enough but that being said again I think there's enough broad enough and enough knowledge out there that we need to have so I'd look forward to a future discussion again especially with uh, the professional societies as well as industry how do we best manage the uh, naval engineering knowledge base across the country because it's strategically I think one of the most uh, important things that we as naval engineers can do for uh, security of, uh, of our nation is make sure we've got the right so that's that's a that's a great question uh, I've given it quite a bit of thought I actually had a discussion with uh, Secretary Stackley a few months ago about kind of the same thing of how you how are you managing the uh, the knowledge base you know for the for the for the Navy and for the nation yeah, I, 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 I echo that. I, I'd add on that uh, it's, it's certainly something to watch, especially if with decreased number of ships, there's going to be, there's just going to be less folks doing the work. And, um, but I would also say that there's, there's uh, essential roles in both industry and in government to have a certain critical mass of individuals that can connect us in the government side to make sure they understand the requirements, work with the operational elements, and translate those into engineering uh, concepts and designs that, that uh, so they can understand at the system level. Uh, it, because of the complexity though of uh, our systems uh, and multiple engineering disciplines that are part of any system on board, on, on board a ship, there may be opportunities that if you have a overarching systems engineering perspective that some pieces and parts could be given out to specialized industry capabilities to provide the design for that, but it would be still governed by the government in terms of the system engineering piece, but there could be pieces and parts that are done by industry, and of course we do this very regularly between Navy and Coast Guard, uh, borrowing ex engineering expertise across the way, but I don't think it'll ever get to a point where there'll be a, a traveling band of engineers that move from place to place. I think each entity has its own set of organic needs for that skill and to be smart enough to make sure that we're buying the right kinds of things and that at the same time industry understanding manufacturing engineering practicalities and driving that into uh, engineering work and, and figuring out ways to collaborate. But I think with systems engineering, the ability to parse those things, there may be some opportunities to do things in a more hybridized way than we've done in the past where it's all in one design house or it's all, all just government only. I think we're gonna see more and more of a, of a, a synchronized effort to design the complex ships of the future. I mean, a great example is just this week, uh, actually we had a couple of folks from the Coast Guard and uh, some civilians and Navy officers from Finland um, over in our house uh, the other day for icebreakers, uh, especially with uh, the way the Arctic is uh, opening up to us and all that. So again, where's the right repository, if you would, to be experts on Arctic operations? And, you know, so in this case, maybe it's not even with us, maybe we really leverage off you know, some of our allies, such as, you know, other countries that, that, that live up north of the Arctic Circle. But that's a great example. And again, I'd maybe talk to you guys about a future ASNI event where we really talk about nothing but how do we manage the naval engineering knowledge base across the country. Sure. I just want to give you one last thought. And, and, and looking at the industrial base, the design industrial base, this intellectual capital across industry and the government, we looked at this about 10 years ago in the submarines because we were not going to have a startup of a submarine design in time. I think the way this, when we looked at suppliers and we looked at the primes and we looked at the government's capacity and capability, and I think one of the ways, it goes back to your ERP discussion about if you can understand it and visualize it, you might have a good chance of managing it. And I think one of the ways we got at the submarine design of bus industrial bases, we did a good job of parsing up the, about the 20 or so specific disciplines, a naval architect, a structural engineer, a systems engineer, and understood the specific disciplines that are necessary to do whatever it is, the DDG and LPD and SSN, 
you pick it but then by understanding that then you can get into the what what is ahead of us and then what can we use these skills that might be resident at a bath or uh, Northrop Grunin Sunnyvale or an electric boat to actually try to get at solving tough problems and doing the designs. Electric Boat did a lot of the DDG-1000 work and it sustained the submarine industrial base. They did CBN-75 propulsion plant work also, but a lot of it was understanding the disciplines that we needed to sustain and given that right kind of work. And I think an enabler of that, and this is really where something like the National Shipbuilding Research Program can help NSRP in helping us enable a common set of standards and tools. We did a good push on that before. And it's very important. We're a lot going to these semen products or common products for a uh, commercial-based design tool. I think also if we can have the supplier base, the primes, and the government using at least first order would be that they at least talk to each other and they integrate. But the best would be it's actually if it's, it's kind of the same product, then in fact we can have a much better participatory of a national design force instead of a GD bath, GD electric boat, HI Newport News, or... Sunnyvale or pick a place, PCC. I mean, we, we definitely can do better there, but there are some enablers that we, if you're gonna, if you wanna do this, we need to start heading in that direction. Understand it and the tool base that goes with it. That's all I got. I think we have time for one last question, and it would be the government's question. Actually, Joe, I think uh, we're going to be, I'm just going to sound repetitive here because I think we got our second question in there. So, uh, I, 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 you're one last one? Go ahead. Okay. We'll see to the Coast Guard. Yeah. Well, we're talking about a subject that's near and dear to my heart with uh, 60, 70 year old ships. Uh, obsolescence of equipment is a major cost driver in maintaining ships. And even just a few years after delivery, even while the line is still being built, things are going obsolete. While it's impossible to know how long a subcontractor will support a piece of particular equipment or system, what recommendations would industry make to increase the long-term supportability of at least newly installed systems? That's really a difficult one. I think it, it's not different, though, than all private industry deals with. So, um, and, and of course, I think because of the, the, the pace at which electronics change, uh, probably principally, it, it's nearly impossible. So it probably resides more in flexibility to be able to plug in things or depend on industry to have the sense if they're going to make a product obsolete. Now, that doesn't happen when something, a company goes bankrupt or whatever, but otherwise they tend to make their products so that you can take this old one out and put this new, better one in. And it's, it, it's just a, um, it's almost um, flexibility and uh, adaptability is, is what I see out in, in the commercial field. And, and I would say uh, for you, maybe it's worth a serious study of how some uh, more complex industries out there deal with it on a commercial basis. We see them changing the products out much faster. Now, that's a little tougher with a 40-year ship, and, uh, but maybe that goes back to how you design the ship. Well, one of the, one of the things, just as a follow-up in what you, your comments, and I appreciate that, is that uh, even a, a, a uh, a model of electric motor can change where uh, there's not really any new technology there. It's just, it's a different motor and now it's a half inch larger because they solved some, may, maybe improved some manufacturing technique or something like that. Those are the kinds of things, and we get back to that change question, you know, during the shipbuilding uh, evolution. Those are the things that really throw wrenches in the works because you got to go in and do all your drawings and all those things and you wonder whether you should just, you know, go out and try to find every one of the old motors and put them in a storeroom somewhere and those kinds of things. So that's a, the kind of thing. And I, I, I think some of that has to do with maybe prime to supplier agreements, uh, maybe, uh, as, a, as an idea. Um, if our specs aren't um, broad enough, uh, maybe that's, or, or they're, they're too specific such that we create niche second and third tour um, buys by the prime contractor to solve the problem. That, that could be it as well. I, I, I'm, like I said, we're struggling with it, especially because it drives cost in um, 
oftentimes too early. I think we all know, and I was being a little facetious with old ships, I wouldn't expect that uh, nobody answers the phone after 40 years, so, or very few. So, but I'm, we're talking really in the first part of the bathtub curve, you know, um, when you're first bringing the asset online, it's very, it's frustrating at times to see systems uh, become difficult to support even early on. Right, and, and trying to standardize it to things made out of steel or fabricated or whatever, it's pretty easy to do. It's really the other part of the equation, and and um, and so it's uh, maybe one item that we see is the amount of paperwork that goes with um, a Navy ship, tech manuals, you know, parts, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff that has to be updated when you change a part, and that is different than private industry. They they accept uh, uh, and operate with much less specialized documentation. I'd like to thank all of our panel, panel members for what I think was a really fascinating discussion.